I'm Laith Jazrawi, Chief of Sports Medicine and Professor of Orthopedic Surgery here at NYU. And the webinar today is Measure Twice, Cut Once, The Future of Digitally Planned Knee Osteotomies. We're going to start off with going through the challenges and pitfalls of osteotomy planning through the traditional technique with either high tibial or distal femoral and much more. And we'll go through some of the issues associated and the problems with that. And that will be Dr. Spencer Stein, who's assistant professor here in orthopedics at NYU. We'll then continue with deformity analysis and osteotomy planning, a digital approach with Dr. Alea. He's associate professor here at NYU, co-director of the Sports Medicine Fellowship, and he's director of orthopedic CME, as well as team physician of U.S. Ski and Snowboard and Rehabilitation. We'll then go into the three-dimensional patients, specific cutting guides, the bespoke osteotomy. Dr. Lomas, team physician of the New Jersey Devils, will talk about this. He can also be heard on weekly heard weekly on the Dr. Radio Sports Medicine Show uh, here on Sirius Dr. Radio. And he's also a member of the Association of Ringside Physicians and provides medical care for um, MMA events and boxing events. And then we'll wrap up with a bunch of cases. We've saved about 45 minutes um, to discuss specific challenging cases and how our panel and how our audience would approach it. For the audience, please, that question box below on your screen, enter your questions. I'll make sure we get to them either at the end of the specific presentation or during the uh, the case presentations at the end. Thank you. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks, Lace, for that introduction, and we'll get going with the challenges and pitfalls of osteotomy planning. Okay, so osteotomies are powerful tools, surgical uh, tools and procedures that allow for realignment of the mechanical axis. The success of the proce procedure depends on multiple factors, including patient selection, concomitant pathology, and the planning of the correction. So I'll start with high tibial osteotomies. The indication for high tibial osteotomy include a painful compartment with mechanical axis overload. This is often manifested as meniscal or chondral disease. The osteotomy in this case can be done in isolation or it can be done uh, in association with meniscal or chondral transplantation. The other main indication for the treatment of ligament instability is the other main indication for the treatment of osteotomies is that for ligament instability, such as in revision cruciate surgery, or for example, posterior lateral corner insufficiency in a knee with uh, varus alignment. Generally, the procedure is indicated in patients younger than 40, although it can be considered in up to patients age 60. The mechanical access deviation should be at least greater than three to five degrees from the contralateral side, and um, a lack of motion or joint space would be considered a contraindication. History and imaging are crucial in planning a high tibial osteotomy. We must understand patient goals and activity levels. High tibial osteotomy may be more appropriate for active patients than arthroplasty, for example. Imaging-wise, a full radiographic series as well as weight-bearing leg alignment views are crucial to determine the amount of axis deviation and to establish the amount of desired correction. Also, MRI is useful to assess chondral and meniscal pathology. So this is how we establish the mechanical axis and plan our correction. On the left, we have an example of how to obtain the mechanical axis. It's passing or dropping a plumb line through the center of the femoral head, through the center of the talus of the tibial plafond. Then the degree of correction can be established. Uh, the most common use for high tibia osteotomy is a medial offloading procedure, so a valgus producing procedure. Generally, when treating focal chondral defects, I correct the midpoint of the knee between the tibial spines. However, a 0.62.5% across the tibial plateau 
has been recommended by authors in the past for offloading osteoarthritis. This would correct the need to about three to five degrees of valgus. Multiple high tibial osteotomy techniques have been described in the literature, um, including dome osteotomy, a callus distraction with external fixation osteotomy, uh, chevron osteotomy, but closing wedge and opening wedge osteotomies using internal fixation are the most commonly used techniques. The center of rotation has to be determined, which is about two centimeters inferior to the joint line and one centimeter from the opposite cortex. Medial opening wedge osteotomies are currently most popular as it's, it's technically easier to obtain the correction angle. Uh, closing wedge osteotomies required a known amount of bone removal to obtain that correction. Uh, there's less dissection on a medial opening wedge and you can stay away from the perineal nerve. There's no need to mobilize or osteotomize the fibula as well. This was just an example of a free establish an osteotomy, and then proceeding with a saw and wedges to produce the correction. A bovi cord or a radiopaque, radiopaque rod uh, from the center of the femoral head through the center of the profonde can be used intraoperatively to establish the mechanical access. Uh, generally, high tibial osteotomy has yielded good to excellent results um, at mid to long-term follow-up. So onto the uh, gist of this procedure, which is the pitfalls and the challenges. There's multiple challenges and pitfalls to high tibial osteotomy. First, determining the amount of correction uh, can be tricky. I mean, generally, these trigonometry principles can be used to kind of calculate how much to open it. Once the correction is done, like I said, a bovi cord or other radiopaque rod can be used to trace the mechanical axis. But this can be re less reliable in obese patients or those with joint laxity. Uh, Non-union and delayed union have been reported in up to 8%, although modern locking techniques have overall made this better with time. Uh, placing the osteotomy proximal to the tubular tubercle as well improves union rates due to compressive force from the uh, patella tendon, from the pull of the patella tendon. Opening wedge osteotomies can have the side effect of creating patella baja or raising the joint line, um, which can lead to anterior knee pain and can make subsequent total knee replacement or arthroplasty more difficult. Additionally, the slope can be inadvertently changed if the osteotomy is not made in the mid-sagittal line or is not perpendicular to the axis of the tibia, which can be somewhat challenging intraoperatively. Maintaining a lateral hinge can also be a challenge depending where the hinge is and where, the, where it is placed, the slope can be altered. Fracture of this hinge point has been reported in up to 25% and can lead to failure of correction. Implant failure or, or non-union. Stopping about a centimeter from the far cortex and leaving about 1.5 to 2 centimeters thickness of the wedge can help reduce this propagation. Um, hint point fracture can also, like I, can also additionally propagate into the joint itself and can potentially disrupt joint congruity, which is not, not a good thing. Other pitfalls include issues with uh, tunnel and screw convergence, such as in medial meniscal root or transplant cases or in revision ACLs. And neurovascular risk, risk is, neurovascular injury is a risk as well. So this is just one paper kind of going over all the potential pitfalls and, and complications of, of high tibia osteotomy, and, and I've kind of gone over most of those. Okay, so moving on to distal femoral osteotomies. Similarly, uh, Distal femoral osteotomy uh, indi indication includes symptomatic compartment overload, and it's typically performed in younger active patients with greater than three degrees, uh, usually of, of valgus from, the, from neutral, from the contralateral side. It can be performed in isolation uh, for unicompartmental osteoarthritic changes, or again, with concomitant procedures such as osteochondral transplant or meniscus transplant. Other reported indications include these things listed here, like chronic MCL deficiency, overcorrection of a prior HTO, um, even extension osteotomies for crouch gait and cerebral palsy have been described. I like this diagram because it shows why uh, a varus producing distal femoral osteotomy is preferred to a high tibial osteotomy. In the high tibial osteotomy, the horizontal joint line um, is, is maintained even afterwards, while in a distal femoral osteotomy, the joint line can now become more horizontal, more normal, so less oblique as compared to the high tibia osteotomy. Regarding planning, uh, opening and closing wedges are both options. Based on the mechanical axis, the correction point will have to be determined, which similar to a high tibia osteotomy can be through the center or a 62 
0.5% overcorrection point, depending on what you're treating and what your preference is. Um, lateral opening edge osteotomy is my preferred technique. It's a simpler exposure, and the degree of correction can be more accurately obtained. This is again as a single cut, and it's you can kind of change the osteotomy correct. You can change the correction as you open the osteotomy. But medial opening and wedge osteotomy can be considered. It has a lower rate of nonunion. It allows for earlier weight bearing. It can be beneficial in large deformities or a patient with risk factors for delayed healing. Reported outcomes have generally been good in distal femoral osteotomies with improvements 20 to 30%, but complications have been reported in about 9% of patients. And conversion to arthroplasty has ranged up to 50% in long-term studies. Um, and it's those long-term studies having the higher conversion rate. So pitfalls can be similar to high tibia osteotomy and generally include over or under correction. It can be difficult intraoperatively to execute your plan and measuring the correction again can be difficult, especially in over obese patients or patients with joint laxity. Fracture of the far cortex or intraarticular extension can be a risk as well. Um, similar to how the slope can be altered in high tibia osteotomy, Flexure and extension of the distal femur uh, component um, can can be inadvertently done, and then can alter the mechanics of the joint. Uh, and also, alterations in the rotation can can occur as well after after distal femur osteotomy. So this is just a case that I wanted to quickly present. It was a 29 year old female. She presented with a grade two B Lachman, a positive anterior draw, um, and a lateral side of knee pain. So just quickly, her MRI did show a lateral femoral condyle chondral defect, which is about 13 by 13 millimeters, and an ACL deficient knee, which you can see there. Moving on to the next slide here, hopefully. Leg alignment showed about seven degrees of valgus. So this was a patient with an ACL deficiency, an osteochondral defect, a lateral femoral condyle, and seven degrees of valgus. So the plan for this case was ACL reconstruction of quad autograft, osteochondral allograft, a lateral femoral condyle, and distal femoral osteotomy. And this is just showing intraoperative photos of the ACL rupture and the sizable lateral femoral condyle lesion. So this case was challenging because of convergence of the screws from the osteotomy um, and, and the tunnels for the ACL. So you can see here, as we were as I was planning the femoral tunnels, I kind of had the plate on there to kind of plan out like where this would go. Um, and I did retro reaming on this, which is not my normal technique, but I thought might be helpful. And osteochondral allograph as per routine. So you can see here, as I was, after I drilled the tunnels, and performed the osteotomy and was placing the plate, I inserted the, uh, the arthroscope into the joint to look down the ACL tunnel to view and see if any screws were getting close or inadvertently uh, uh, coming into coming into my uh, ACL tunnel, which it did not. So afterwards, there's the ACL. I mean, everything went well. We were able to avoid it, but it was challenging. It took longer than it would normally take. And you can see here on the lateral, the ACL button, just here posteriorly at the cortex, and I did have to leave that screw hole empty because of fear of convergence of the screw in the ACL tunnel. All right, so finally onto tibial tubercle osteotomy with a few minutes left. So indications for tibial tubercle osteotomy include patella instability uh, with an elevated tibial TTTG or tibial tubercle trochlear groove distance. Um, patella alta can also be corrected with a distalizing osteotomy. So the other indication would be patella alta. Additionally, tibia tubercle osteotomy can be performed for symptomatic chondral loss in the patella femoral joint in isolation or combined with resurfacing. Um, this can be powerful as two, it's been shown that two centimeters of anteriorization can reduce compressive forces by 50%. So it is another powerful procedure. This was an arthroscopy infographic that I liked, uh, showing showing kind of a nice job of the pathology, 
uh, and the technique as well as the outcomes of different tibial tubercle osteotomy techniques as there are different variations of a tibial tubercle osteotomy depending on what you're treating. From a cartilage restoration perspective, distal and lateral lesions can be treated with potentially an isolated anterior medialization, although I think that's somewhat controversial. I think some of us would consider some sort of cartilage transplant, but certainly it's an option. Whereas a mid or central patella lesion uh, could benefit from a steeper slope anterior medialization. So steeper slope, we're thinking about more of like a 60 degree cut, as you can see here on the bottom, uh, possibly with a cartilage procedure in this case. For instability, anterior medialization is useful for elevated TTTGs and can be combined with distalization for patella alta, for patella alta. For regarding planning, uh, typical cuts would be 30, 45, or 60 degrees. Again, 60 degrees giving you more anteriorization depending on how much you medialize it, as opposed to a 30 degree or 45 degree. A 45 degree is basically a one-to-one. -one. So for Every millimeter or you know centimeter medialized, you'll get one centimeter of anteriorization. Um, the amount of medialization in general should aim to correct the TTTG to about ten or less, uh, which um, you know, specifically is important in any instability. And depending on distalization, you know the amount of distalization will also depend on the uh, amount of patella alta or the CDI. I use a Cantat to Shops ratio. There's a few ratios you can use. Uh, one should plan out screw trajectories as well. And think about the order of events of planning a kind of procedure, which is pretty often, such as MPFL reconstruction or chondral transplant or resurfacing. Typically for me, the TTO is, is kind of at the end of those procedures. Um, finally, think about the shingle, because the shingle that you're cutting out should be at least five centimeters and, and eight millimeters depth um, to allow better bone, better purchase on the bone, and, and we'll see lower, potentially lower complication risk. So this is just a few slides just showing a freehand technique of a tibia tubic osteotomy where exposed pins are placed and saw guides are used to make the cut and, and just a freehand technique under fluoroscopy and just just basically open freehand just feel and gestalt. So pitfalls of the procedure. While overall while an overall successful successful procedure, multiple complications have been recorded in tibia tubic osteotomy. It's up to about 5% and includes things such as infection, skin irritation, non-union infection, and fracture. Even though in this paper is quoting uh, skin irritation as a minor complication, I mean, it's really not that minor. It can be quite bothersome to the patient. It can, it can require return to the OR for, for rasping down bone or removal of hardware, removal of screws. Also notably, the uh, complication rate is significantly higher with distalization when performed, probably due to loss of blood supply from loss of the periosteal hinge. So if you are distalizing the tibial tubercle, which may, you know, may ultimately be necessary depending on what you're treating, I think that's just an important thing to, to discuss with your patients. And you may want to consider things we'll talk about, like adding an extra screw or just some techniques to help avoid non-union of, of the site. So some common pitfalls do include, like I said, non-union, which is just less than 1% overall. Um, again, higher in this case when a distal hinge is released. Uh, methods to decrease the rate of non-union include things like maintaining at least two out of three of your screws 90 degrees to the osteotomy, avoiding thermal necrosis by irrigating, adding potentially a longer screw by two centimeters just to make sure you get a good cortical fit and, and good compression. And then again, and then avoiding an osteotomy shingle that's too thin, so you do have some cancellous bone on the back of your of your cortex of your osteotomy. Of course, uh, as a theme, we'll see undercorrection and overcorrection can be problems. Undercorrection does not adequately adjust the pathology, and overcorrection can lead to bony prominence or potentially even non-union. So that really sums up my talk. Um, hopefully you get an idea of the powerful and effectiveness of osteotomies, but at the same time, there are multiple pitfalls and, and challenges in planning, and then, and then of course, executing your plan from things like fracture, non-union, and then overcorrection un and undercorrection as well. Thanks.
Okay, now we're going to move on to Dr. Lomas, who's going to give us an overview about the bespoke osteotomy. Again, any questions, please put them in the question box and I'll make sure we get to them. We can go on to the next talk. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Laith. And uh, uh, that was an excellent overview, uh, Spencer, on, on osteotomies. And what we're going to do now is is just, uh, you know, go uh, into the future and so, you know, see what the latest technology is adding to uh, osteotomies and our ability to perform them more precisely. Um, Spencer did a great job of outlining the major uses for osteotomies about the knee. And, and I think uh, they will always play a role. Um, you know, they're not just used for arthritis, as Spencer mentioned, you know, they can be very important uh, parts of joint preservation when other procedures, other joint preservation procedures are performed. And so I think that they're always going to play a role. And the question is, how do we really maximize their precision and uh, eliminate uh, possible complications and possible drawbacks? And so one advent has been in creating patient-specific instrumentation, the so-called bespoke osteotomy. And the idea here is creating an osteotomy that is patient-specific and thereby limiting complications. And we'll talk about some of the pros and cons of that. Okay, so um, in this uh, talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about the rationale for these 3D printed guides and patient-specific instrumentation. We'll talk a little bit about uses, including for increasing or decreasing tibial slope for meniscus root concomitant uh, fixation or uh, meniscus transplantation done in association with an osteotomy, and similarly for ACLs done at the same time as an osteotomy. We'll look a little bit about, we'll look at uh, outcomes, and then we'll have a case example that brings it all together. So I think the first question is, you know, what is PSI? What is patient-specific instrumentation? And we've started seeing this more and more in orthopedics. I think um, some of us are familiar with using this in arthroplasty situations. And this is really just a, another version of that, but specifically for osteotomies. And so the idea is that you create 3D printed patient-specific guides. These have to be templated by CT. Uh, and then the implants themselves don't need to be 3D printed. These can be off the shelf, but the 3D printed guide allows precise application of that plate on the osteotomy in order to minimize uh, issues like tunnel convergence, uh, overhang, et cetera. So that is the basis of PSI. If we have a solution, we should have a problem. And, and th this is a case of mine where similar to Spencer's case with the ACL and distal femoral osteotomy, this was a complicated case. This is a patient, 46-year-old female, had medial-sided pain and instability. And if you look at the images, you can see the patient's in varus. They're essentially missing their medial meniscus and also have an ACL tear. So if we look at the, the treatment here, and this is a scope picture from her medial compartment, um, you can see there's a little bit of chondral damage, but, but probably not enough for uh, an osteochondral allograft. Uh, but we can see there, there's three things that we need to fix in this patient. She, uh, she needs an ACL reconstruction, a medial meniscus transplant, and a high tibial osteotomy. Well, once you start doing the math about how many tunnels are needed in the tibia, you really start to worry about running out of running out of room. So you have your ACL tunnel, you have two tunnels for the meniscus, uh, and a high tibial osteotomy on top of that. Um, so one option is to do uh, what I did, uh, which is uh, do everything you know, like Spencer did, uh, just with a very careful and systematic tunnel management during the case. But, you know, really this took long and this was a bit of a headache. So, you know, we ended up uh, doing the ACL tunnel um, after we did the osteotomy and then we did the meniscus uh, transplantation, the, the um, uh, root tunnels for that. Um, but it, it really ended up being uh, having to move 
jigs around and and take th- take screws in and out, uh, try different techniques. Um, so even though we had a very good preoperative plan, in real life, it, it took quite a bit of time. And so this is the type of situation for which one of these patient-specific uh, instrumentation guides could really be helpful. Let's talk a little bit about those advantages. So First of all, you can template digitally ahead of the case. We see this in the arthroplasty world already. You can really plan your, your cuts, your uh, drill holes, your instrument placement, your implant placement. Before the case, make sure that everything looks good. Uh, and then you don't have to worry about that in the middle of the operating room. It creates these patient-specific jigs, uh, which tend to help decrease implant prominence, and as we talked about, decreased tunnel convergence, it really makes the case more efficient and uh, time savings is cost savings and allows for significant versatility. So in situations where we might not have had that same amount of control, we can now affect the slope or tunnel placement. This is what it looks like. So again, 3D printed, we want the production of these guides to be quick, low cost. We want the implants or the guides, of course, to be sterilizable. And, um, and you know, the idea is to basically create these and make it easy enough to uh, create that uh, they can have widespread use. So the benefits, you know, some of them are pretty apparent. If you have a patient-specific guide, it tends to decrease the amount of fluoroscopy you have to use in the operating room. And we'll get into the pros and cons of that in a second. But in general, you're going to have less operative time. You don't, you're not making the cut uh, ad lib. You're making the cut as prescribed by the guide. It tends to be pretty straightforward to place the guide on the tibial contour. You have more neurovascular protection. These are calibrated guides, so you know how deep the screws are gonna go. You don't have to keep looking on fluoro. Uh, they tend to be single use that has benefits in terms of sterility, reduces learning curve. Osteotomies can be quite challenging. And if you master the use of these patient-specific guides, it can really decrease that that uh, the amount of cases that you need to master the procedure. And it can facilitate complex cases like the one I just showed. But of course, like with any technology, you have some drawbacks. And I think the radiation one is really the key. These implants require a CT to create them. And that uh, CT scan, of course, adds radiation low to the patient. Um, we're actually looking at a study. Uh, we're we're um, uh, studying this uh, in our institution. And uh, what we we're really trying to see the total amount of fluoroscopy used intraoperatively in addition to the CT and how that compares with no preoperative CT and just fluoroscopy alone. But one thing that I think is important to keep in mind is a CT scan of the lower extremity generally yields fairly uh, limited radiation. So 0.16 to 3 millisieverts in comparison to intraoperative fluoroscopy, which can get up to 20 to 200 millisieverts per minute. So of course, it really depends on how much fluoro you're using. And that's, of course, when the fluoro is on, not just having the machine in the room. But it, um, it, it probably is likely that the combination of CT and limited fluoroscopy ultimately yields less radiation load to the patient than just doing fluoroscopy alone without any pre-op planning. Uh, the second drawback is the cost. These implants do represent an additional cost, and so that has to be factored in uh, with uh, you know the, the uh, total cost analysis and obviously relevant to all of us these days. There is a learning curve to this device itself, these patient guides. And so for those who are very familiar with doing a high tibial osteotomy with traditional guides, this may be something to, to consider. And then you can also have miscommunication between the surgeon and the manufacturer. So for many cases, there'll be direct communication between the surgeon and the manufacturer. And, and of course, anytime you have that, there's a possibility of broken telephone. But in general, I, I would say that uh, those events are pretty limited. So here's what they look like. Um, nice 3D printed guide. And you place that over the contour of the medial tibia. And uh, those holes are uh, for the uh, drills and ultimately the screws. So let's talk a little bit about specific uses. So slope, that's a big one. And, and really, that's always been an issue with high tibial osteotomies. Uh, we know that slope increases 
after both medial and lateral closing, so medial opening and lateral closing wedge osteotomies by at least two degrees. And we know that increasing slope can be associated with ACL failure. Here's a study out of, um, or the, by Preventures Group who looked at this. And the, the concept is that with this guide, you really can fine tune your slope, whether you want to increase it or decrease it, um, that can all be dialed in to the preoperative plan and then ultimately the outcome. Studies have shown that uh, if you do the slope concomitantly with an ACL, you can decrease failure rates. And here's a, a really nice example where you can see the imaging of that ACL tunnel on the tibia and how it's interdigitating right in between the osteotomy uh, plate screws and, and avoiding any interference there that may lead to uh, graft involvement. So essentially you decrease that tunnel interference you have a biplanar slope correction ability. It's a single stage procedure. You don't have to stage them and the safe and the uh, play fixation is safe. And one thing that has come out from these devices is really identifying that this hinge point, unlike most of the time where it, it, it comes uh, with a standard osteotomy, it's a little bit more posterolateral, lateral, it really should be more anterolateral lateral in order to preserve or even uh, decrease tibial slope. Another great application is in the meniscus. And whether it's a meniscus transplant or just a, a standard meniscus root, oftentimes we will perform concomitant high tibial osteotomies in these cases, and you can really avoid that tunnel. Um, and, and oftentimes it really you know, depends how this is fixed, but if you fix it with sutures, um, you know, you're really just doing your osteotomy blindly and, and hoping that your uh, sutures uh, end up not interfering with, or, or the um, suture tunnel ends up not interfering with the plate and the screws. So this is a, a really nice way to avoid that. What about outcome studies? So these have been validated as far as their accuracy is concerned. Here's a study out of France. They looked at 10 cadaveric tibias and found really minimal correction errors. So these are errors between the preoperative plan and the postoperative outcome. Um, if you look at that, it's quite impressive. Frontal plane, 0 0.2 degrees, sagittal plane, 0 0.1 degrees. I mean, th these are virtually identical. The, the outcome cuts and corrections are identical to, to the preoperative planning. So it's a uh, pretty impressive um, um, reliability. And there have been studies comparing the patient-specific implants to conventional instrumentation and technique for high tibial osteotomy. So here's a study, again, out of France, multi-center. It was not randomized, but they looked at quite a few patients, 126, three groups, first group conventional, second group with navigation, and third group with these patient-specific 3D printed implants. And what they found was that that third group had the least amount of difference between the preoperative plan and the postoperative result, although it was not significant in this study. Um, but again, it certainly shows that it's it, at least as precise, if not more, than our standard high tibial osteotomy techniques. So you're in the OR with this implant. Anything different? Are you thinking anything different? Well, one thing is you want to display that preoperative plan in the OR, similar to uh, arthroplasty cases. Uh, achieve adequate exposure. Oftentimes, these um, it, these guides are a little bit bigger than the traditional ones. So uh, just especially early on, giving yourself enough uh, an ample room will be helpful. Do not change the anatomy too much by over-resecting osteophytes. Uh, there's a 3D model that typically gets given with the patient guide, and it's very helpful to look at that next to the uh, actual tibia and make sure that it's on the right spot and make sure that all of the points are in contact. And then that's really going to limit errors. So here's an example of a case. This is a 40-year-old male. This is actually uh, Dr. Jezrawi's case. I uh, had two weeks of worsening pain uh, and had had previous surgery in the right knee, medial collateral ligament and meniscus injury. And on exam had range of motion zero to 125, uh, no ligamentous instability. Um, here's their x-rays, pretty good joint space. And you can see an old medial collateral ligament repair staple, but you can also see that the patient is in varus. And so uh, this patient needed a meniscus transplantation in addition to a high tibial osteotomy. Well, this is exactly what we were just talking about. So you plan the intended correction, there's your device, you do that preoperatively, and then you can plan those meniscus root tunnels for the meniscus transplant. You can plan those uh, plugs 
uh, to avoid that plate, avoid those screws. And then ultimately, here it is intraoperatively. Um, you could see going through the guide, you get a pretty impressive placement of that posterior meniscal root. It'll come out in one second. It's I mean, really smack dab bullseye right where you want it. And then you complete the case, put in the transplant, and have your plate as well. No interference, no danger of uh, tunnel convergence. So to conclude, high tibial osteotomies, as uh, Dr. Stein discussed, very biomechanical biomechanically sound. They optimize joint biomechanics and a very useful tool concomitantly with other joint preservation procedures. And the patient-specific implants create a reproducible technique, decrease complications, improve precision. But I think we have to study cost and radiation drawbacks and uh, really understand when these are best used uh, but certainly the future looks bright for osteotomies uh, and, and, and really making them patient specific with these, uh, these guides and this technology. Thank you. That was great, Guillaume. So two, so far, two terrific talks. Uh, Spencer led us off with some of the complications associated with traditional osteotomies. We, we went through Guillaume and, introduction of the 3D patient-specific cutting guides. And now we're going to get into Dr. Alea, who's going to continue us on this journey through transitioning into the use of these 3D printed cutting guides, either when you use it in isolation for your traditional osteotomies, or as Dr. Lomas you know, mentioned, in these combination procedures where things can get quite challenging and a nice preoperative template could be helpful. Thanks, Mike. All right, uh, everybody can hear me? Good, all right. Um, so I'm gonna talk about something a little bit more challenging, uh, sort of tying it all together in terms of HTOs, DFOs, and tricks to get this right in isolation and in combination. All right, so we're gonna talk about some upper level stuff. These are my disclosures. Um, I will say that I do consult for one of the uh, patient-specific osteotomy companies. Uh, however, there are several on the market. I've got pictures from several of them in here, and they all are excellent. So probably my biggest disclosure um, is that I'm a quote-unquote metalhead uh, when it comes to osteotomies. I've seen some of the inlay products fail. Uh, they fail typically on the lateral side for HTOs. You'll fracture out the lateral side, and that inlay winds up becoming the new hinge point. So as compared to having your hinge point more lateral, your plate now becomes your hinge point, and they'll rotate around that and lead you, unfortunately, into more varus than you started out with. So I've seen this happen a few times uh, because that fixation is not incredibly robust. And we as surgeons have to remember our principles of trauma surgery. You want strong, rigid fixation when we're plating fractures. And this holds true in treatment of high tibial osteotomy patients as well. So why do we use these? Obviously, it's going to be for OA and symptomatic deformity. Uh, but more often than not, lately, we've been treating it for knee instability, whether that be in the coronal plane or the sagittal plane. And we really cannot forget about patellofemoral instability, where distal femoral osteotomies have certainly come into the mainstream for patients with extreme valgus. As Guillaume was talking about, meniscus root tears with significant varus, more than five degrees, should be considered for high tibial osteotomy, because if you're going to do that procedure and keep them in 10 degrees of varus, they're going to have a substantially higher risk of failure. So if you're going to keep them non-weight bearing for six weeks, perhaps you should do an osteotomy with it, substantially improve their chance of a successful outcome. And then we also use them in double osteotomies for big corrections. You don't have to do <clears throat> Taylor spatial frames or significant um, uh, lengthening over time in terms of these 3D correction models. You can certainly do double osteotomies, one above the joint, one below the joint to achieve a good outcome in one surgery with hopefully minimal rehab. So HTOs, as we know, are excellent procedures for joint preservation, OA, cartilage, instability, as well as revision cases. And they're obviously frequently done in combination with other procedures, sometimes in a staged fashion, sometimes in a single stage fashion. And when we're talking about osteotomies, we have to define two things. Number one, are we doing that for osteoarthritis or instability? Because that might determine where we wind up putting our mechanical axis. 
Typically for instability cases, we put them kind of straight down the pipe, not pushing them too far into valgus or too far into varus, keep them roughly about 50% of the axis from medial to lateral. However, osteoarthritis, we might go a little further, that traditional Fujisawa point of 62.5%. I tend to go around the um, the downslope of the tibial spines when I'm correcting for osteoarthritis, more towards the center when I'm correcting for instability. Because we have to understand that overcorrection is poorly tolerated, especially in high-level athletes, younger patients. If you overcorrect them, they will certainly feel it. They might have a limb length discrepancy. They might change their gait mechanics. So these are all things that we have to think about. However, at this point, let's talk turkey, combination procedures, and how patient-specific instrumentation can help you. As the gang has talked about, it's resulted in several things, less radiation, improved intraoperative time saving, radiation not only for the patient, but also for the surgeon and the staff, eliminate convergence with other screws, other tunnels, and you can certainly plan for ample bony real estate by distalizing your osteotomy, making a uh, biplanar cut as opposed to a biplanar correction. If you air your osteotomy a little more distal, you can certainly make an osteotomy cut around your tubercle and give yourself much more real estate to make tunnels in the proximal tibia. And then finally, hinge protection, as I'll get into later. First, we'll talk a little bit about patellar instability. And patellar instability obviously can be quite traumatic for patients and very difficult to treat for surgeons. This is a patient of mine who there's who her instability was so severe that she would simply just dislocate in bed. Uh, this was a video that was captured by her dog camera, and she gave me permission to use this. But as you can see, she's got that sort of miserable malalignment where she's in valgus. She's got increased tibial tubercle uh, trochlear groove distance, and she's got a flat trochlea with patella alta. So this is a case of severe patellar instability that you've got to think about correcting her al alignment as well as correcting the soft tissue restraints in the knee, such as the MPFL. In terms of the planning for this case, one of the biggest things that we can do with patient-specific osteotomy planning is not only plan our osteotomy cut, but also make sure that we have plenty of room for the MPFL tunnel. So in this case, we dictated out where the MPFL tunnel was going to sit, and we made sure that our screws were certainly long enough to get good fixation, but also short enough to accommodate for an MPFL tunnel with plenty of real estate. And that's what we did for this patient with a simple distal femoral osteotomy, tibial tubercle osteotomy, and an MPFL reconstruction performed simultaneously. And this patient went on to have a very good outcome. The thing that we have to think about is when you're correcting one side with such severe deformity, oftentimes patients will complain about the gait imbalances that they will have. So you have to counsel them preoperatively that there's a very strong likelihood for a patient like this, that they are going to want the other knee done, even if it's not clinically symptomatic, simply because of the alterations of the gait mechanics. Then we get into ACL insufficiency with malalignment. This is a 24 year old male. He's a professional skateboarder. And as you can tell by his x-rays, He's had several injuries along his way uh, that have been quite significant, all from skateboarding, and this one was no different. This was a ACL postal out of corner injury. You could see that the LCL is pretty much balled up and torn off the distal aspect, and he came to me in a chronic setting. He had a complete foot drop and this quote-unquote triple varus knee. So this is a knee that had a good amount of meniscus left, good cartilage, but a little bit of pain in the medial side. And this is somebody that you would certainly think about changing their alignment, especially in this case of triple varus with an ACL insufficient, LCL insufficient knee. So this is where our patient-specific instrumentation comes into play. Not only can you change the coronal alignment, but you could also change the sagittal alignment of this patient. You could see that in the bottom left, the screws are angulated posteriorly to gain fixation, but also leave ample room for an ACL tunnel. And that's what we did for this patient. We did a, a high tibial osteotomy, slightly altering the slope, more importantly, uh, changing the coronal alignment. Subsequently, did an ACL reconstruction with quadriceps autographed, as well as a posterior lateral corner reconstruction, all in the same sitting. And this patient has on, gone on to do well with a much more stable knee, and he's quite happy. As Guillaume talked about, coronal malalignment with meniscus root and meniscus transplant has to be considered, especially for meniscus transplant, but now often, more often than not, meniscal root injury patients, because as we know, meniscus root injuries are in the same situation for the most part as osteoarthritis. You get your 40 to 60-year-old patient who already has some potential degenerative changes in the medial compartment. What came first? Is it the chicken, the egg, or do you just simply have to break the wheel altogether, get them out of varus, and hopefully eliminate this 
downward trend of osteoarthritis. So these are patients that if they come in for a meniscus root tear, you should be getting uh, full length alignment films because if they have significant varus, in my opinion, more than five degrees of coronal malalignment, they're going to substantially benefit from a high tibial osteotomy to offload the medial compartment as they heal that medial meniscus root. So here again, you could see the guide. This is one that I used in my own clinical practice for a case. Uh, this is a patient that was 55 years old, had symptomatic medial meniscus root injury, as well as varus deformity. You can see exactly how this guide sits. You wind up putting this guide over the plate. You drill all the holes over the plate through this guide. Finally, you fix your meniscus root at the very end of the case. So essentially, you put this guide over the plate after you fixed it, and that bottom right hole right here accommodates the medial meniscus root drill bit. And then you could see it on this picture right here. After we finish the osteotomy, which looks quite nice, as Guillaume showed in, in his talk, you can hit the nail on the head right here, sort of like pin the tail on the donkey, except it's more accurate. You're not blindfolded. So this is something that is uh, very substantially helpful in my own clinical practice to treat these patients. And this is this patient's post-operative imaging, only three months post-operative. You can see the alignment is corrected, and that osteotomy is already virtually healed uh, with the use of very minimal bone graft. And then we have to get into the situation of large corrections, because this is a very significant valgus deformity for the knee. And you can see that this deformity might be coming from two places, not just the femur, but also the tibia. And you can see on this x-ray and subsequent um, juxtaposition of patient-specific instrumentation planning that she's got about five degrees of deformity coming from her distal femur and another five or six degrees of deformity coming from her tibia. So this is a case that if you thought about simply correcting the femur alone, you might put yourself in trouble. So if you corrected the femur alone, which is the picture on the left, you would see that there would be substantial joint line obliquity. That femur would not really be perpendicular to the ground. That femur would be sort of sliding laterally, as opposed to the picture on the right, which would be a dual level correction, where you're doing an opening level osteotomy on the femur and a closing wedge medial osteotomy on the tibia you can see that the joint line obliquity is much improved. That joint is much more perpendicular to the ground, and hopefully you would avoid that sheer, those shear force uh, excesses that you would get with an oblique joint line. So the advantages of dual corrections would be as follows. Number one, when you do a closing wedge osteotomy, obviously that healing is going to be much more robust, and you can simply fix these with staples as opposed to rigid fixation because you are not trying to hold open a gap. Uh, it's a much higher increased risk of union as well if you're doing it on the femur because it's a smaller correction. Smaller corrections lead to better union and lower risk of hinge fractures. You can address multiple planes of deformity, as I just showed. Does not drive the femur or the tibia into massive overcorrection because you can stay within five degrees of normal values. So this, again, is that picture here just showing exactly what we're talking about, keeping that DF, uh, that proximal uh, medial tibial angle the way we want it, hopefully between 85 and 90. The same thing with the distal femur, as close to 90 degrees as possible. Now, why do we care about joint line obliquity? Now, this has been shown in several studies that it has a negative connotation uh, and, collabor and um, correspondence with outcomes. This is a nice biomechanical study uh, that they looked at degrees of joint line obliquity. And if you had 10% joint line obliquity, you could see the substantial changes on the pressure mechanics on the medial joint, you can see how it lateralizes the contact stress on that compartment and potentially increase the chance of osteoarthritis. Uh, this was a study that was performed out of Asia, which showed patients that had a much higher medial proximal tibial angle after surgery, AKA a much larger joint obliquity, tended to do worse. They developed lateral pain, substantially more lateral pain post-operatively and negative outcomes. So it's important to keep that joint line perpendicular to the ground when we're doing these cases. This is a nice study out of Olivier's group in France, and his group has really pioneered these uh, patient-specific osteotomies. They've done tons of research on them. I strongly encourage many of you, if you're interested, to look into some of their work because it's outstanding. Uh, this is looking at by excuse me. This is looking at dual level corrections. One in the femur, one in the tibia. All the patients in this study had both tibial and femoral deformity, which is important. You obviously want to correct at the location of deformity and not simply overcorrect the femur or the tibia when it's coming from both. 
They found that the use of dual level osteotomy substantially decreased the amount of hinge fractures, which is as expected, and also substantially improved joint line obliquity, taking it from almost six degrees to two degrees. So that would have a very positive impact on a patient's recovery. This is looking at one of my own cases. Again, that plan on the left would be bad. That would be incredible joint line obliquity. That patient probably wouldn't do very well. We did a dual level correction on the patient. You can see an opening wedge distal femoral osteotomy laterally based as well as a closing wedge medial high tibial osteotomy. And that joint line is directly perpendicular to the ground. That is exactly what we wanted and achievable when the use of patient specific instrumentation is maintained. And we're doing her other knee in about three weeks. As I said before, these significant valgus knees often feel it and they require the contralateral limb to be done at times. Sagittal plane alignment, as Dr. Lomas talked about, uh, is very important as well when we're talking about ACL and PCL, because as we know, as the slope changes, you can increase the strain on either your ACL or your PCL. And there's been nice papers and nice technique guides. This was the one from ProVenture in arthroscopy techniques, again, showing how a patient-specific instrumentation osteotomy could substantially improve tibial slope while correcting for a coronal plane deformity as well. Now, the reason we care so much about this is because the tibia is a triangle. When you correct a coronal plane alignment issue, oftentimes you tend to make that osteotomy gap rectangular. And the shape of the tibia really does not help you in this situation. When the tibia is a triangle and when you open the gap, it tends to be rectangular. So you have to make sure that your gap is open more posteriorly than anteriorly, almost two thirds, one third, so that we're preserving slope. And when we do our patient-specific osteotomies, we can maintain that. And Dr. Ronald Watt's group up at HSS has actually shown very nice papers showing just why it's helpful uh, to use patient-specific instrumentation when it comes to uh, excessive anteriorization of a hinge for an osteotomy. Now, unstable hinges are potentially important because, number one, that they might be able to lead to uh, less union rates, but also because the osteotomy can change position, especially if you're using one of those inlay plates. So it is quite easy to break the hinge if you have a very, very small hinge point. It's technically difficult to get that perfect. So the solutions would be, again, patient-specific instrumentation because we can really put the hinge anywhere we want it. And we can actually protect that hinge using some of our patient-specific instrumentation. And here you could see a, uh, a guide placed onto a tibia preoperatively, and you could see how those drill bits basically are developing your hinge axis for you. So the position of the guide dictates the position of the drill bits that you use to create your hinge. So your hinge is already created. The risk of perforating out that hinge is a lot more reduced, hopefully improve your outcomes. And again, there are multiple osteotomy companies out there that perform the same thing. Another one of the companies you're actually, you have the ability to shoot what we call a hinge pin, meaning there's a pin that's shot across the tibia directly at the hinge point. And by having a pin there, that could protect, protect your hinge. And I'll get into that in a little bit. And never forget the purely sagittal slope changing osteotomies, because you can certainly do this with patient specific osteotomies as well, going either above, through, or underneath the tubercle, elevating the tubercle, really the choice is yours. You can talk about the, uh, the Bertrand Sonnery Cotet technique of going above the tibial tubercle. This is a patient who had three ACL failures with an intact meniscus, totally normal coronal alignment and collateral ligaments. This is a patient who had almost 16 degrees of posterior tibial slope. So this is an isolated uniplanar closing wedge anterior osteotomy. And you could certainly use patient-specific instrumentation to improve your outcome here, change the slope, and really minimally discuss, excuse me, minimally change your coronal alignment. You could also use these for PCL insufficient patients that have had post-traumatic deformity. This is a 17-year-old kid who had a significant growth plate arrest maybe about four years prior, developed severe record bottom and a reverse curvature, uh, reverse slope of their proximal tibia, which required an opening wedge anteriorly based high tibial osteotomy to basically increase their tibial slope and improve their outcome. Finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about hinge fractures. Does the use of patient-specific osteotomy reduce these hinge fractures? Honestly, the answer at this point is probably yes. Because if you shoot a hinge pin, then theoretically you can protect that. And again, Olivier's group has shown that the prevalence of hinge fractures has gone from almost 43% to about 17%. So the use of that angular pin to protect your hinge can substantially improve your rates 
of reducing hinge fractures and hopefully improving your rates of union. So in summary, the challenge that young patients with variable permutations of injuries, whether it be cartilage, meniscus, ligaments, et cetera, do benefit from osteotomies in this advent of patient-specific approaches can certainly ease the technical aspects of the case, case and make your thought process much more smooth. It has the opportunity to improve symptoms and function, and again, hopefully delay or avert the development of DJD. So thank you for your time and attention. Terrific. All great talk so far. Uh, we're going to get into the cases now. Any questions, again, please send them over and we'll we'll respond to them. Uh, one question that has come through, and I'll shoot this out to the panel, rotational femoral osteotomies for patella instability. Um, they wanted to get your thoughts on it. I'll start with, uh, I'll start with Dr. Alea. Your approach in terms of determining the amount of you know, rotational deformity and your approach in patella instability and, how, and trying to figure this out? So number one, I think the patients that need rotational osteotomies for the femur are very few and far between. I mean, they've got to have very, very substantial femoral antiversion where you get them prone on a table and they rotate. And they rotate um, almost like 70, 80 degrees, those are patients I consider it for. And then obviously you would get a CT version study to truly understand the amount of femoral version that you have. So these osteotomies can be done again with a patient specific approach. Um, you can do them proximal, you can do them distal. Um, I've personally have not done a derotational osteotomy using any of these sim systems, but I do know people that have do done a tremendous amount of these osteotomies that have done some rotational osteotomies. And they've actually said that it's been very helpful in their planning, very helpful in their surgical approach because it minimizes the amount of fiddle factor that you have to do with K wires and measuring angles and making sure that you've got your angles correct. And then hold not only that, but also hold, holding the osteotomy together in a position because that's difficult also with these rotational osteotomies. Now, again, they have instrumentation for them. I haven't done the rotational osteotomies. Perhaps it'll, some, it'll be something that I use when I figure the time and the patient is correct, but I simply haven't been to, to that just yet. I mean, I've only been using these for about a year and a half, two years, I've done well over 20 of these without question. Um, and the, but I haven't done a rotational one yet. Yeah. I, th I think the important aspect of this for the people who are tuning in is to try to figure it out. You know, does the patient have rotational deformity? And Mike brought up a good point that you have the patient lay prone. If their feet touch the table, that means it's more than 90 degrees of, uh, femoral antiversion, then that's when you have to start considering the, um, you know, derotational osteotomy. And certainly for me, that's my test. If it's getting close to it or greater than 60 degrees, you, we get we get the CT scan and see what the, the, ro the rotational amount is. I, I would just add one thing to that, which is, you know, just like, uh, like Mike mentioned, you know, with coronal plane, correction where where oftentimes you have to do the contralateral leg even if it's asymptomatic this is another situation where rotational uh, change uh, significant change on one side makes patients relatively unhappy about the other it just it just makes them very asymmetrical so you have to have a conversation with them about doing the other side as well if it's even if it's not symptomatic so that's just uh, I think another logistical point and pragmatic point when uh, dealing with patients. Yeah, that, that's very important. Okay, we're going to try, we're going to get into some cases now. Again, shoot your questions over uh, uh, anyone in the audience. And I'm going to throw a lot of these questions back at the panel and see their thoughts uh, about it. And again, a lot of the cases we've presented are very challenging cases, but the whole idea is that this is supposed to make, if you're if you're patient population and you're dealing with osteotomies, this is supposed to make surgery easier. So we'll get we'll get into the first case. Again, nothing pertinent for disclosure uh, for disclosures. The first case is a 24 year old female with chronic left knee pain for six years knee instability while running, no mechanical symptoms, no significant swelling. Her history, 2017, uh, ACL reconstruction with hamstring autographed. 
She then underwent uh, in 2020 left knee arthroscopy. She had a, what they said was a partial retear of her ACL, and she underwent a lysis of adhesions at that time. Her family history was consistent. Uh, her brother underwent multiple ACL reconstructions and had multiple revisions. And she states that her knee feels unstable at this point. Here are her pre-op x-rays. Any concern, Spencer, about the prior surgery and any concern with these x-rays? I mean, yeah, looking at the prior surgery, um, potentially uh, femoral tunnel is a little vertical. It was a hamstring uh, graft, which pretends a little bit higher pro risk of, uh, of re-tear. And then just looking at this, there may be a little increase in the tibial slope here. Okay, so that that that's important. So definitely increased tibial slope. Let's go to the. We'll look at the coronal alignment next. Okay, uh, so I'll I'll give you uh, this one. Her alignment is you know varus about five degrees. Okay. Okay, so let's go into the options for this. I'll I'll go back. Uh, let's start with Guillaume. What's your approach to this? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I think this this is a nice illustration of a lot of the concepts that, you know, we've discussed today. You've got uh, a patient who's in varus. Uh, I seem to remember you you say that the, they also had some some pain in, in addition to the instability. Um, and then we we just looked at the sagittal slope, which might be increased. So it'd be nice to get a, a number on that. You know, um, you know, as far as when I would think of correcting, uh, probably anything past, you know, 10 degrees, you know, I'd really start considering it. Um, you know, one, one other point that often comes up with this, and again, it's, it's one thing to just treat the bone, right. But you're, you're treating the human and, uh, some of these patients, if they already hyperextend a little bit, you do have to worry about decreasing that slope too much because they can end up with extreme recurvatum, and and that you know that also can uh, lead to issues with uh, graft failure, even if the slope is corrected, and and they don't tolerate that that well either. Um, so I would want to see what they look like, make sure they're not in uh, hyperextension. Uh, would want to know what their ligamentous laxity is like, but I think. My initial plan would be uh, planning a, a high tibial osteotomy uh, with some degree of slope flattening, some some decreased slope, and then trying to plan my ACL tunnels, my uh, revision ACL tunnels around that. Okay. Um, again, for the whole panel, is this you know a PSI case? Can you get away with doing this? You know, with the traditional ways we've done it. I'll start with uh, Mike on this, Alea. Yeah, so I don't think doing a traditional approach is really getting away with it. I mean, that's that was the gold standard before PSI came about, and PSI is yet to be proven to be the gold standard. So, you know, in, in my own opinion, I think PSI will be proven to be the gold standard in time, but at this point, we don't have the data to support that. Um, you can go traditional on this and do a standard osteotomy you could do a biplanar osteotomy and, and by that i don't mean a biplanar cut i mean a biplanar correction uh, we have to understand that if we want to do larger corrections in slope we might have to think about changing the hinge point on this osteotomy because if you're going to do a more medial hinge point on this you're going to need to do a pretty large correction of coronal deformity to be able to obtain significant amount of sagittal deformity correction so if we were going to think about doing a more slope correcting osteotomy as opposed to a traditional coronal osteotomy, that hinge point is going to rotate pretty anterior lateral in nature. Um, if we're going to wind up doing something like that, um, the benefit of doing a, a PSI on this is because again, these hinges, if you make it very anterior lateral, those hinges are, are very, um, can be very weak and you can easily propagate through that hinge. So that's why I think PSI is so important for this. But the other thing I want to discuss is, is what, Lath, what's the quality of the meniscus here? Does she have one? So she has a meniscus. Okay. So, yeah, so that's good. That's yeah. good for her, obviously. Yeah. This was, uh, this was not a meniscus case, but my, those are great points that Dr. Alea brings up. And 
prior to PSI, for me, traditionally, I would have approached this opening it immediately and gauging it intra-op and keep cranking it open, not concerned about overcorrecting her, right? To try to get my slope correction, which I, which for me was the most critical in this case. So, and that leads to problems like Dr. Leia brought up where you, you're stressing that anterior hinge, trying to get that slope corrected and can lead to, a, you know, a hinge fracture at that point. So, for a pure, like about, you said, yeah. Leith, for, for a pure, a much more pure closing wedge osteotomy before the ad, advent, excuse me, before the advent of PSI, this would have been a closing wedge osteotomy for me and not an opening wedge osteotomy. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna concur with that. I mean, that avoids the the pitfall of of fighting for that hinge point. Um, the downside of the closing wedge is you kind of get one shot at it. So, and, and again, the PSI is nice because it gives you, you know, the cuts exactly where you want them, but this is one where you'd, you know, really want to like, <laughs> like the title of the, uh, webinar says, you know, measure twice. And, and I think the great thing about these things, look, there's a lot of smart people on this webinar giving talks for me. Sometimes I, it can get into a lot of math, a lot of technical hyperspace. And when you're doing these PSIs, they send you all this planning and it, it really breaks it down for you um, and helps you understand the deformity. And I think Dr. Leia brought up several cases where as part of the planning, you can see the the where the deformity was coming both from the, you know, the tibia and the femur. And I think when they start to break this down, they give you various approaches to correcting the problem. And I think that's valuable um, to see it. And then this was the first. You know, so my, my go-to is always trying to figure out if I can do an opening wedge, medial osteotomy. And then when they sent this back to me that the maximum correction I can get without overcorrecting her in the coronal plane was to get her slope to about 12 and a half degrees. So helpful, but still out of the normal range of six to 11 degrees. Would, you know... Um, Dr. Stein, does this concern you that I'm not, you're doing this whole big case and you believe the slope's her main issue, that you're not getting a full correction? Yeah, that's a challenging one. Um, I mean, I think you're getting some correction here, so I think that's helpful. But then the question is, do you have to like stage or do you have to go for a different plan? Um, you know, potentially just like a, a closing wedge or, or uh, an anterior osteotomy. Yeah, this is always challenging. It's what 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 is ex, what, what can you expect? Yes, it's definitely better. What is it? You know, getting it into the normal range, and then this was the second plan they sent. So the uh, anterior closing wedge, and this, based on this plan, would get her anywhere between eight and nine degrees of correction. And they also templated the old ACL reconstruction tunnels as well uh, in this. So just to bring up the nice sort of way they've given you both both approaches to sort of try to figure this out. And I think the, you know what I ultimately opted for was the close you know the closing wedge anterosti you know otomy with the, at the same time also correcting you know some of that varus where you would take out a larger wedge more laterally based but the great thing about this is seeing where your hinge is positioned that it would be a more immediately based hinge. And this, again, helps you understand where your hinge is and how important it is, especially in the sagittal plane. And then also adding where your ACL tunnel is going to be. So that's where these things become, you know, very helpful. So any, uh, Dr. Lomas, any, has your, based on what I've shown you, any change in your approach in terms of tackling this? And what I guess let's get into some other things. Okay, we're correcting the the slope. We we've got that. What graft are you choosing in this patient? And are you doing any other concomitant procedures? Uh, yeah. So this is a hamstring a failed hamstring autograft. Uh, right. And how old's the patient? Twenty four. Yeah. So you know, I think the the textbook answer here is is BTB uh, autograft. Um, for, you know, just a, a standard revision case. 
you know, here you're running into issues with uh, possible, you know, again, right. Taking some of that tubercle with your, uh, with your graft. And so is that going to interfere at all with your osteotomy? I, I think again, you <laughs> were, we're uh, selling this PSI pretty, pretty hard tonight, but you know, I, I think with that, you could probably, you know, get a good sense of, you know, avoiding the tubercles. So I think you probably could get away with that. And then, you know, just fill the, the uh, donor sites with uh, bone graft. Um, I, I personally have jumped a little bit on the quad uh, ACL bandwagon. And I, in this particular case, uh, if the pa- my, my one caveat with the quad is in smaller patients. So if this patient were under five foot four, I, I might reconsider that. You're just taking a, a high percentage of the quad tendon. I've seen those patients get contractures. Um, so I, I think if, uh, as long as it was not interfering with anything, I think a BTB autographed uh, here would be acceptable. But um, I, I would have a a, a low threshold to, for, to to do a quad just because you know, f- fewer interference, tunnel interference issues. Um, you have suspensory fixation, uh, a little bit more reliable in a case like this. And you, you may avoid some headaches in terms of uh, screw interference. Yeah, I think the quad's a, uh, an excellent point. I, I think that's a, you know, a reasonable, uh, you know, certainly graft choice, especially with the harvesting the tunnel and the tubercle, even though this is a super tubercle osteotomy, you're taking a lot of bone out in the in the same area. Uh, Dr. Alea, any other additional procedures? I guess I'm getting that. Would you do an iliotibial band tenodesis? Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, I would do quad with bone on this for revisions. I like quad with bone so I can get some bone in the femur. Um, I, I agree with Lomas. I, I don't know about doing a BTB with a HTO, especially closing wedge. Um, I'd probably fix this with staples as opposed to a plate so I can get more room, really minimize my chance of tunnel convergence. These heal amazingly well with staples. <laughs> so I'd probably just use some staples for that. And then definitely an LET. I mean, you're in there. The, the data shows that LET decreases your, uh, reduces your risk of ACL retear by almost two or three fold in a revision setting. So I'm going to add an LET on this. Okay. Spencer, any, any other thoughts or you're in agreement? Yeah, I mean, I think that's it covers really, really well, and I think I like how you're doing into your closing wedge, and you're able to correct the the chrono alignment too. So that's perfect. That's a great plan. If you were going to do an opening wedge on this one, you know, you would potentially consider staging this one out and allowing the bone to heal, bone grafting all the tunnels, allowing the bone to heal, and coming back after it's healed, and then finishing up and doing an ACL if you're doing a meniscus transplant at the same time. But with a closing wedge, you have to worry a lot less about that. Yeah, I think it's reasonable to stage these. I, I, I think as you get more comfortable, uh, the PSI technique allows you to do more things at the same time. So very loose, big pivot. I drilled my femoral tunnel before doing the osteotomy. She had no screw in the femoral tunnel. And then big anterior incision. Big medial sleeve. So when you do an anterior closing wedge, right? Lateral wedge too. We talked about that, you know, the the actual model on. I think that's very helpful. We bring the pictures up in the OR to make sure it looks right. And then we get the wedge out. And I think this is, it's nice. It gives you that fairly accurate wedge. Now, knowing where the hinge point is, I'm able to, you know, then cut the rest of it down posteriorly extend the knee and then here's the plate going in and then BTB make a relaxing so cut in the tubercle case. for this what's that make a small little relaxing cut in the proximal tubercle for this yeah actually let me think well you're taking it from the anterior wedge right uh i did yeah, i mean just so you don't nick the tubercle like a one of those like a biplanar cut yeah no i didn't in this case they didn't have that on the uh the plan Good point. So this was the original shot with the uh, the 3D printed cutting guide. What do you guys think on the tibia? I, I You know, looking back at it, I know there's some tissue there. It probably is coming out here. Maybe I could have accepted it. But I thought that it was a little more, you know, medial. So I freehanded this. I put the guide there that I liked. 
I thought I came a little more central. And then I was able to pass the graft, use the metal screw, nothing, you know, weird about that. And then it was right under the plate. So that that's again where the PSIs, and then I just, you know, you know, added a a Lemaire. Nothing, you know, certainly unusual about that. Um again, uh, we're, we're, oh go ahead. go ahead. I was gonna say that's a great point, you know, that the the guide, I mean, it was close if you think about it, right? Yeah. It's like a couple millimeters away. But but it is a good point that, you know, in, in vivo, there's gonna be little permutations that that can throw it off not necessarily that um the correction was off but you know if the guide is not exactly where it's supposed to be you know by a couple degrees you, you can run into that so i think that's uh i mean the nice thing is it was very close so worst case scenario would i think have been acceptable but uh yeah, i think you did a nice on the fly correction there yeah i, I think this yeah, th this is always, these are always challenging cases, but the point is that I think the PSI certainly made it less stressful for me, you know, doing these challenging cases, but at the same time, I think they can make our regular traditional osteotomies that we do a lot more reproducible and start to, you know, sort of introduce this to the more general orthopedic population who doesn't do as many osteotomies so that they're doing it you know, safely and reproducibly. And so this is sort of an intra-op shot showing me piercing through the lateral cortex posteriorly and uh, the correction level where we got to about eight degrees. So this worked out very nicely. She's about eight weeks out now. You know, it's too early to tell, but, you know, so far um, she's doing great. Okay, case two, 32-year-old male. Right knee pain and instability. So another story. Tor towards ACL 14 years ago playing basketball. Had a BTB. Failed. Had a revision with allograft. Failed. He underwent then a staged bone grafting. Had another allograft revision. No Lemaire. No osteotomies. Failed again. Now he's complaining of pain and instability. Non-smoker, exam, 2B Lachman, pivot shift. Here is x-rays. Game, you want to tackle this one? Uh, okay, yeah. So, you know, similarly, you know, 16 degree uh, sagittal slope. Um, hard to see what the tunnel dilation is you know pro probably we get a ct on this one just given all of the you know, the, the previous surgeries yeah look at the mri yeah so meniscus is trashed immediately okay nice So we got a tibial tunnel of about 18, 19, femoral tunnel, let's call it 10 at, at its most. Okay, so to sum it up, ACL retear, medial meniscus deficiency. We got a max femoral tunnel width of about 12, and then a maximal tibial tunnel width close to 20, and a posterior slope of 16. Okay, Guillaume, what's your approach to this case? Yeah, okay. So, well, I mean, I think the this guy's a multiply failed uh, patient, and, and really it's that, um, you know, definition of insanity. Uh, there's just small permutations they're, they're trying, uh, but it just doesn't seem to yield results. So I think, you know, for me, I, I think given that slope, that, that is pretty impressive slope. Um, man, you guys got a lot of high slow patients. I don't, <laughs> I, I, th those are pretty rare in, in my practice, but, uh, I, I would, uh, you know, you're definitely going to throw an LET at it. You're going to do a, I would do a biplanar correction. I think you've got to correct it. Uh, the question is, are you going to graft, you know, the, the tibia, um, cause that's about 18, 19, you could get a, you could get a bigger, 
um, I, I would consider grafting just because it's, it's, you know, I, I want to really deal with like a neutral playing field here and not have to compromise my, my tunnels based on where there's bone. So that, that would be maybe the one thing that I, I would add to this, uh, a staged approach where I grafted, you know, I t- took the hardware out, grafted the tunnels and and then came back and probably do what's uh acwo oh uh, closing, wedge. Closing, wedge. closing wedge yeah so and i would use the, use the psi stuff let hto acl reconstruction quad auto mike first thing i would do is counsel the patient and tell them that you know perhaps they're not going to get the same level of function that they think they're going to get and tell them that this now, this procedure now is for instability with daily function, not instability with sport. All right, they're not going back to the sport that they want to go back to. Not after three or four failed ACLs like this. It's rare that a case like this goes on to the perfect outcome. Plus, you have to count some of the reoperation rates anywhere between thirty and fifty percent. If this is going to get where we think it's going to get, being meniscus transplant, osteotomy, ACL, etc. So, counseling, laying crepes, the most important thing. The second most important thing is doing what's best for yourself in terms of um, what's going to make your life easiest because of the hard case, tough case, tough outcome. Um, I like staging these. This would be a bone graft plus a closing wedge osteotomy at the same time, allow all the bone to heal, then come back. You're dealing with basically virgin bone, do the meniscus transplant, do the ACL. You don't have to worry about tunnels converging. I think that's, yeah, that's all reasonable. Spencer, your approach. Yeah, I think with the tibial, with that tibial uh, diastasis, tibial tibial diastasis, I think you have to bone graft that. And then, yeah, I like the idea you can do the HCO at that time. So that makes sense to me. Um, I mean, I think you know you could try counseling them for non-op with with a brace, I suppose, but it doesn't sound like that's going to go well. It sounds like somebody is pretty, you know, wants it in back some level of function. So I think pro- most likely this would be a stage for me. Yeah, this patient was great. He just wanted to walk without his knee giving out. So it, it it made it easier for me. And that's why he was coming for his seventh surgery. Uh, this is one of my earlier cases. So I, I agree. I was looking for, for any reason, you know, to stage this. And the patient did not want it staged, but I stuck to my guns, especially early on. I don't want to complicate things. And I definitely, you know, knew that the, the tibia needed to be bone grafted for sure. And, the decision about doing the meniscus transplant, my initial thought with this was that I was going to unload him through a medial opening wedge pretty significantly and uh, do a slope correction that way. And that was my approach. And I staged it. I, I bone grafted the tibia first, and I did the osteotomy at that point. Um, I went through, and I presented this case just because I went through a medial wedge to correct the slope on this case. And then the second stage, I brought him back and did... I did an allograft. I'd probably do a quad now. So again, very they're all very similar with these high slope and failures. They got a big Lockman, big pivot, and you know they're they're they have a lot of you know laxity in their knee. Uh, I, I present this case also because there's other systems out there. You know, we presented um, uh, one of the cases. Uh, uh, there's BodyCAD that does this, and there's also a company called Newclip. That has their own version of this. So these are the various appro- you know, approaches. So just to show this implant, uh, and they're all very similar. So in this case, the scope, the meniscus is trashed here. Uh, laterally is fine. And then ACL is shredded. What's left of it? Non-function, essentially. So my approach is I the the uh, I didn't want to complicate things because I knew I was going to use an in this case I ended up using an allograft so the tibia the femoral tunnel was no no major concern to me but I used the dowel on the uh, tibia and these are great to use for revision cases just put it over a guide wire and then uh, this is the we we showed the body cad this is the new clip plate very similar just you know a few slight differences they used the hinge pin. You know, it, that acts as, you know, uh, in many ways, you're shooting your saw and your osteotomy, your osteotomes towards that hinge. So in this case, we're cutting through 
posterior lateral. And then Mike talked about that biplanar cut in order to achieve that slope correction. So you could see I'm, in this case, I'm going through that posterior lateral cortex. My hinge is anterior medial, sorry, is anterior lateral. And that's where I'm hinging off to get that slope correction. And then I'm able to check based on, so it makes it a lot easier in terms of determining this. And I got an interop shot showing the slope correction. And the idea is that you want that posterior aspect of it, uh, of the tibia larger than the anterior aspect of it to get the correction. We were able to get him down to eight degrees. And then we brought him back and we did the, um, this was after the first stage and we brought him back for the second stage. And again, I, I'm, I don't need to get into this, but again, we use the BTB allograft in this case. Uh, I'm assuming everyone would, you know, Everyone, Mike, you would have used quad with bone? Probably quad with bone. You can certainly make the case for allograft with this. If you're correcting slope, doing a meniscus transplant, if you chose to do that, LET. Remember, your goal here is to get him walking without giving way, not for him to do backwood skiing. So I think you'd be just fine with an allograft on this one. Okay. Hey, um, hey when, when you did the ACL, uh, that was... That, that was independent of the PSI stuff, right? I mean, you, you just said the beginning. So did you have to navigate those screws independently? Right. So let me go back to that. So I had to take one of the screws out. So, yeah, I mean, again, I kind of had a feeling that we were going to have an issue. So I, I, I took out one of the screws that I knew was going to be a problem. And uh, again, here's just another shot of the meniscus. Uh, you know, looking back, could have done a meniscus transplant on this for sure. I ended up just, you know, repairing it. Not sure what that actually does, especially with this amount of deficient meniscus. Uh, but, you know, in retrospect, probably do, even though I overcorrected him, probably do a, a meniscus transplant. But this guy had been through so much surgery. Uh, I didn't want to add... Um, you know, more to this. So again, I just removed the screw and, you know, was able to get the ACL through without an issue. Okay. Let's wrap up a couple of questions. Someone's asking what an LET is. Uh, you want to address that Spencer? Sure. Yeah. It's a lateral extra articular tenodesis. So um, it's another way of stabilizing, especially rotation and ACL deficient knee uh, and the type that we've discussed is taking a central posterior part of the IT band, leaving it attached to Gertie's, routing it under the LCL, and attaching it to an isometric port uh, just around the uh, lateral epicondyle. Um, there's other techniques as well, like an ALL reconstruction, but it's kind of along that route. Other question for Dr. Lomas. Can you address foot-ankle alignment as knee malalignment can impact foot alignment. Example, orthotics. I think his question is asking, can you use orthotics to help with knee malalignment issues? Uh, there's been some uh, studies looking at the use of orthotics for, uh, for example, uh, medial... Um, compartment arthritis, like isolated unit compartmental arthritis. And basically what it says is there's no difference between like a lateral uh, wedge, a lateral heel wedge, or just like a neutral orthotic. So it actually seems like orthotics may help those specific patients, but there's no, there's no evidence that, you know, specific orthotics can. So as far as like correcting alignment, um, they're not, it's not very powerful. Um, so the reason I bring up the arthritis is because, you know, symptomatically there may be patients who respond to it. So obviously worth trying, but, uh, I think, you know, the cases we're describing, you know, there's a major malalignment that's contributing to, uh, either failure of a, of a previous stabilization procedure or reconstruction or, um, in the setting, you know, of arthritis in, in a varus knee, it's, um, you know, we're, we're really trying to make a major correction. Um, but I, yeah, I think it's, it's always helpful to start off with the easy stuff. And, and that's obviously, 
an easy way to to go initially. So n- nothing wrong with trying an orthotic. Okay, very good. I think our time is up, but I did want to just wrap up that we presented a lot of complicated cases, but there's nothing. The, the PSI technique can be done for a straightforward, you know, traditional single plane osteotomy corrections as well. Um, again, with, with accuracy. Um, so any last minute thoughts I got, we got to answer one last question and then we'll wrap it up. Do you use it sometimes in conjunction with surgical interventions? I'm guessing they're referring to the LET and the answer is, uh, yes, we use it in almost all revision cases, uh, using the LET to control rotational instability of the knee. Um, okay. Thank you guys. That was a great uh, panel, Dr. Alea, Dr. Stein, and Dr. Lomas. Um, again, any more uh, questions, you can email the NYU Ortho webinar series, and we can you know, respond to them uh, via email. Thanks again, and goodbye.